Hi, I'm Carolyn Chen, and I'm a composer. I live in Los Angeles, and I make some music for instruments and some music for people playing listening games. <laughs> and Batya. Hello, I'm Batya. I live in San Diego. I am a violinist, I am a violist, and I, am, and I sing as well. And uh, I get to do two of those things for this piece, which is which is really exciting. At the same time. At the same time, yeah. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> so let's talk about how the, um, first of all, how did you all cross paths and how did this piece uh, kind of come to, to be? Yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Go ahead, Carolyn. <laughs> yeah. I guess we met each other in San Diego in grad school at UCSD. Yeah. Um, and we did get to work with each other a little bit in San Diego, but um, like not in an extended way. I think we just kind of hung out maybe a little yeah. bit more than getting. Yeah, to we, we would, we were, you know, we, yeah, we were, we were friends and our friends and even though our lives are far, farther apart now, but I was, I feel like we would see each other and just, um, yeah, we would just, just, it felt like a working friendship, even though we weren't necessarily working together. How did oh. how did you guys start working on on this together? Well, yeah. So I had a um, an interesting opportunity that um, some some uh, a couple had offered to help me, and I asked them if I could um, use some of their help to commission some music. And they said yes. Um, and so I asked Carolyn to write a piece for my voice and violin um, because like Carolyn said, we had never really um, had an opportunity to work in an extended way together. And uh, this was this was a chance, um, yeah. And where did you, so Batya, like- And I guess the- Yeah, how crazy are you? Why do you want to sing and play at the same time? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the more I spend as a violinist, the more I feel like I am compelled by some force to forge a path that is not there yet. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah you know, I am maybe sort of um, straying farther and farther from the classical practice, even though... Um, even though it's a huge part of my identity and a huge part of my playing. But I feel like in terms of the, the kind of music making I want to make and the way I want to collaborate with people, I'm always looking for ways to carve out something that feels a little bit more, um, uh, more aligned with, with me. And, um, yeah, and, and I, I've always felt a kinship with Carolyn in that sense. I, I guess I can sort of see that in her work, although I'll let her speak for herself. In that yeah. yeah, I think one thing that's special about Bati as a performer is that she works in these different worlds. Um, I mean, obviously you have your classical music training and you were playing in the string quartet, but also you were playing in this jug band and you have a beautiful singing voice and like this background in kind of vernacular music and also that the baby bushka band so our favorite kate bush <laughs> tunes are also in your repertoire um and so that that i think that diversity of like love for these different kinds of music were part of what i was thinking about when we started working on this piece and then so Batya, maybe you can just sort of describe the piece a little bit. Like, where do, how did, so you came, um, you brought the texts to Carolyn. Is that right? Or no? no okay, so talk not. about that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, reached out to Carolyn and said, you know, would you do this? Would you um, write a piece for my voice and violin? And I'm interested in using, um, you know, different texts. I had, I had requested, um, the use of Estella Lauder's poem or poetry. She mm -hmm. is a friend of mine. 
and um, I, I was inspired by reading her poetry to possibly have it set to music. And that became the first movement of some dragons um, called Two Dragons. Hmm. And, um, but then the rest, and, and even that poem, Carolyn, you found that, um, which was really cool. I, I had just, you know, suggested some books maybe, or just mentioned her name. And then the next thing I knew you had found this particular poem. Oh, I didn't remember that. I thought you sent it to me. <laughs> That's so funny. I, mean, I think I'm remembering that right. Um, yeah, well, because I'm, I'm sure that is right, only because um, I had never seen this poem before. You well, should. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I thought, it, yeah, it just really struck me because the, the poetry that I have of hers is um, based upon it, she's uh, based in the Great Lakes area in Door County, Wisconsin. And so a lot of it is about um, the Great Lakes, sailing the Great Lakes. And then she has another book of poetry about um, sort of like memoir, like her her past, her mother's, her um, grandmother's. And, um, and this poem is, uh, yeah, not from either of those works. And it's about her, it's about her traveling in China. And, um, and so I just thought that was really neat. But I, you know, it's funny, what I remember of the very beginning of this project is that we were just kind of talking about life and about kind of being in a sort of transitional space as you're kind of trying to develop your career after graduate school and like finding a new community and trying to sort out how to live basically and how to kind of set up mm -hmm. like a, a space to do your work and a space to explore in a way that like really supports you as a person um, in wh wherever you may be, be or wh whether wherever you may be going. And I remember you saying you were going to go on a residency I think in Michigan at the time. And so I had this image of you just like kind of setting off from the San Diego where, which is sort of like a station and like going on a new adventure in a cold place. <laughs> 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 um, and so when I saw that poem, I was thinking, oh, she, she went on an, an adventure in a place that was not her home. And she had this experience seeing somebody working in this different art form um, would, like she, the poem is about working, um, seeing a paper cutter, mm -hmm. carve like cut cut out these these dragons, um, and I think I was thinking about courage, um, and I, I think to me that's what unites all these different stories, the different because um, the each movement is by it, it takes the text from a different person mm -hmm. and they're all like explorers and travelers. Um, I mean, some of them are literally Nellie Bly who went around the world and kind of wrote about that adventure, but also Rosalind Franklin, who was kind of exploring like knowledge and like scientific development and um, that kind of spark of discovery when she had a hint about what DNA might be structured as and um, there are these different threads that kind of weave through because it's a double helix and there are two dragons in the very first movement. And actually, Bacha, you I think you also mentioned you were reading Rebecca Solnit's um, The Far Away Nearby. And yes. there's that amazing footnote about moths that drink the tears of sleeping birds. Yes. That runs all the way through the book, like this kind of book length footnote. And it's it's this gorgeous piece of writing in and of itself um, where she starts with that one image, which is a scientific discovery. And the findings of that journal article are one of the movements, um, but it that image kind of, she kind of un, untangles it or unravels it um, and spins it out into all of these different kind of mythologies of different traditions and different ways of interpreting who is the moth and who is the bird and who is sleeping and drinking. Um, and actually like thinking about that led me, it was kind of in inspiring to me to write another um, piece, like an, an orchestra piece. Um, but awesome. yeah, I, I forgot where I was going. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> how the how, well? How did you come? How did you decide um, on like what? What are the the poets that you t you t ended up deciding on, Carolyn? Um, do you actually, do you sorry, remember I remember them. Yeah. Well, uh, do you mind? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I have, no, I have the score in front of me. If you oh, want. Okay. Yeah. So the first movement is Hello <laughs> Water. And um, the second movement is um, this line, moths drink the tears of sleeping birds. But Carolyn chose to use the scientific text that that actually that that came from, that Rebecca Solney took and spun. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an article about this phenomenon. Um, and then the, the third movement is Rosalind Franklin. And she is just writing about the structure of DNA. Um, the fourth movement is Amelia Earhart, um, Paper Tigers. And actually, these next four movements, I don't have as much knowledge about where, what texts you were actually drawing from, Carolyn. I mean, obviously, there are these women's, but if there are books you had or just things you came across online. So, yeah. I think I, I was looking for explorers, yeah. um, and then I kind of pieced together um, things. So the I think the Amelia Earhart one is just one of the quotes, or that she has kind of advice for being an adventurer. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's so cool though because she's she's talking about, you know, she's talking about flying, like, uh, or everyone has oceans to fly if they have the heart to do it. But she talks about the fears are paper tigers that that just feels so um, like surreal, you know? <laughs> it's like, whoa, like Amelia Earhart, like, yeah, she was like out there. You know? <laughs> yeah. like, it's like cool advice, but it's also like trippy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I thought it was cool. Um, Okay, the, the fifth movement is called Weightless Dragons. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is, um, I think her name is Ching Shi. Um, yeah, she's a, a pirate, a, ch a Chinese pirate. Isn't she like the most like prolific and successful pirate ever? <laughs> she, she like led the largest <laughs> fleet ever. <laughs> she's, yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, mythologically, it was like thousands. I mean, who knows how many, but yeah. she, she was super successful. And she arranged her own retirement <laughs> because she was so successful. The emperor like sent somebody to negotiate with her for her to stop. <laughs> like they didn't kill her. She, she arranged her own retirement plan. <laughs> That's good, good on you, girl. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this, this is, uh, it's just filled with, um, I, I'm, I just, I'm looking at the text and I love how she's in one section, you have her just stating rules, basically. Yeah, uh, she had her own pirate's code that was different from what the norm was on other pirate ships. It was like, you know, slightly more feminist. She had a different sense of justice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. from the botch captive women. Yeah. And and I pierced the ears of men who transgress. Uh. <laughs> um, but then that that also becomes sort of mystical and magical, the ending of that. Um, she talks about weightless dragon dragons, uh, flocks of them rising in the sky. And I think, um, yeah, as I've gotten to know these texts and work on this music, I, I, I feel like I keep coming back to this realization that all of these people were, um, all these women were letting themselves sort of dream beyond reality in a way, which I don't know, maybe that sounds kind of trite, but it just feels, um, yeah, it just feels inspiring <laughs> to kind of feel like you can, you could really let yourself really go somewhere um, to kind of push yourself along. 
yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but I should say that the, there was a kite signaling system. So that would be the, I mean, that would be the literal interpretation of I see. that um, okay. between her and the emperor, you know, like they would, um, because she was like the vixen and he's the emperor is the dragon um I but i i mean i think i don't i think it was something about her accepting the negotiation um and yeah <laughs> through a system of, of kites it's like uh, semaphore yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool that sounds yeah. it just yeah i guess it sounds very whimsical but very practical <laughs> at the same time <laughs> you know it's great it's really ingenious Wow. What's the next one, Batya? The next one is Nellie Bly. It's called mm -hmm. 72 Days. And this movement is interesting because it sounds like it starts with, I need a vacation. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, me too. You know? yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, but she's, you know, then when you read about what she actually did, um, she, and, and I, I can't remember what year it was. I'd have to look it up. But um, it's like the end of the, the 19th century, just into the 20th century. But she traveled around the world in 72 days. And um, yeah, and, but, and, then, and then she ends with home to Hoboken, you know? <laughs> so it's just like, that, that is also surreal to me. <laughs> She's like, okay, done. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, you know, and that's, and that's, Kind of how the the quality of the movement is too. I'm gonna go to Hoboken. <laughs> no, no, period. <laughs> like it's no big deal, you know. Like, what? What happened? What? <laughs> I think at the time she was competing, she was writing this um, magazine piece, this serial magazine piece about her travels, and she was competing oh. with another man who was writing for a, I think maybe a competing magazine or something, and mm -hmm. she beat him. <laughs> Um, I wonder, is this like sort of inspired by, yeah, yeah okay, <laughs> around the world in eight, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. And then the last movement, which is really astonishing, is um, the the writing of Lynn Cox, who was a, is this incredible swimmer. Yes. Um, yeah. And it's a, specifically about when she swam the Bering Strait in 1987 um, and really inspired the end of the Cold War in a way. I mean, obviously wasn't the only piece of that puzzle, but like- Complex. <laughs> yeah, a little complicated. A little complicated. But, uh, but like, yeah, really um, just brought a lot of attention to, to that situation. Um, but it's just, it's just a beautiful movement. It's been very challenging to learn um, and and also feels relevant now with just small um, small parts of the text. Like she talks about um, touching the hands of the Soviets when she gets out of the water. Mm -hmm. She talks about human contact. And I've been thinking about that, you know, as we're all separated right now mm -hmm. so i've been thinking about that um just the power the power of that mm -hmm. yeah and well how do you how do you kind of bridge your your t these two worlds batya because you are you come from a really virtuosic classical tradition you are um amazing uh amazing violinist and just so technically proficient and you can kind of dance all over the violin in a way that is just really flamboyant in, in some way. Um, and your singing comes from a, a different idiomatic exp mode of expression. It's pop. It's this really beautiful, it's like close miking intimacy type of singing. And so how are you, um, how are you practicing these, these two things? these two instruments that are wildly different and have, and have their own uh, uh, challenges to, to kind of deconstruct and put back together. How do you even, how do you even put, put it together? Um, yeah, that's, that's such an interesting question. I, um, you know, my violin practice was 
inspired by um, listening to oldies radio as a child. I mean, that's, that was really my first love of music um, was 50s and 60s pop. And um, what's interesting right now in my life is I feel like um, when I got a little bit older, I started becoming more serious about the violin. And with that came a lot of the things that I've been grappling with as a violinist, um, anxiety, and also just being part of a culture that I've never totally felt like I understood or that um, felt comfortable to me. And I'm at this point where I'm kind of breaking out of that. And I'm, I'm really trying to let my violin playing um, reflect qualities that are not um, about projecting in a concert hall or trying to sound us, uh, you know, a, a particular way. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to free my violin playing mm. and <clears throat> singing helps me do that. Um, but then on the other hand, singing is something that I've only up until recently done for fun. And um, it is, is a big work on singing and just to realize um, what what it takes to do that and um, so I've been uh, so it feels like it's been this simultaneous process of letting the violin unravel and then letting and then sort of building up my singing without without sort of putting the, the boundaries around it that I feel like I'm breaking away with the violin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like becoming a better singer or a sing uh, be being able to control my voice so I can actually do it without succumbing to this feeling of like, you know, I have to, I have to like strip away all of the feeling so I can like, you know, nail it mm -hmm. um, because that doesn't feel, that doesn't feel um, like that's the point. And um, for me and <laughs> <laughs> um but I do feel like when I do the violin and singing together, it feels, it mostly feels like one instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so most of the time when I'm practicing, I'm doing it at the same time. Um, I do break it apart and work on the singing or work on the violin playing. But then when I feel like I'm really in the piece that I'm really working on the piece, I don't feel like I can separate them really. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, Carolyn, like, how did you, yeah, how did, how did you approach? I mean, this is like, to me, it feels like really complex <laughs> to, it, I don't know, maybe for some people it feels like, oh, it's no big deal. Violinists sing and play all the time in, in, <laughs> in other, um, in like pop, um, in the pop world, but how did you, how did you kind of piece together these, these two seem kind of disparate um, elements? Um, I mean, I guess I had heard Batia play in the jug band yeah. um, and that that's probably the sonic image that I had closer in my mind. Um, because I, I mean, I've heard you play in all these like really complicated new music and classical contexts, but um that one, I think maybe for me also personally, as I've gotten further and further away from my training, I'm kind of rediscovering just music that feels fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's fun to listen to. Um, and that feels fun to play um, in a way that where I don't have to be an expert. And so, I mean, I think a lot of these, some of the movements are extremely intricate. So I, the, it, it gets a little bit further from that sense of like a folk song but um I I was really trying to think of them as songs mm -hmm. um so it, it started you know that it started from the text from Estella's poem and then finding these other poems and then just trying to communicate to write the songs in a way that you can hear what what the story is mm -hmm. and who's speaking um and that was more important to me like I wanted it to fit Batia's voice and I, I wanted the stories to be communicated um, in a way that um, I think in earlier writing um, 
you know, my music might have been more centered on like a sonority or like something that was happening in in the harmony. Um, but here I, I, I wanted it to be about the story um, and then kind of thinking about writing. I, you know, I think of the violin part. Sometimes it's accompanimental and sometimes it takes up the melody um, in the same way that I think in the beginning, in the first movement, she talks about these two dragons and I was thinking about the DNA helix. Um, that they're sort of winding around each other. And if you're standing at a certain angle, you might see one closer to the foreground or one of them is more prominent, but they can kind of keep turning. Um, that's, sorry, that's like really mesmerizing. I'm like lost in that little image of like the, the dancing helix, you know? Yeah, yeah. and um, I... I remember reading something, just a paragraph you had written about the piece, Carolyn, and you called it a song cycle. And I was like, yeah, it is a song cycle, which just hadn't thought about it really about like, oh, and because aspects of music, yeah, keeps getting sort of um, brought up in different ways, almost like there's little themes that happen mm -hmm. in one movement that then carry through to another. Um, so even though there are these yeah different texts that it feels like you're weaving you're threading something throughout all of it yeah there's something very schubert <laughs> very, you know, about it in a way it's like you're on like inventorizer you know we're sort of going on this journey and exploring these different these different feelings of of this uh the space of of exp exploration um it's really beautiful i mean was it was the the point always to to only select um female poets or did that just, was that ha kind of a happenstance sort of a thing? Um, I, maybe that's just what happened. Mm -hmm. um, there, I think they're, they're, they're mostly not poets by occupation. Right. Um, and it was, I mean, it was kind of me being inspired by what they had done by these people. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the people were, came first and then looking for their words. I mean, Estella is obviously a poet um, and so that was sort of the anchor for everything. And, um, you know, some of them, I think the Lynn Cox, uh, the, the text a lot came from a BBC radio interview. Um, mm -hmm. And the pirate one was mostly me kind of piecing together stuff from just reading about her. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it was for, for me, like the, the, the actions, the things that they had done were what seemed most central. And then the text came after that, like it, yeah. Hmm. Is there anything else either of you would like to say about the piece? Are you nervous, <laughs> Batya? Do you feel the pressure? <laughs> no, honestly, it's just, I'm humbled by this piece. It's taken me so long to learn it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I thanks for your patience, Carolyn. <laughs> Not yeah, I um and what's I've I've basically since I've had the whole score, I've been working on the whole thing, but the the especially the pirate um movement and um the Lynn Cox movement, those are so tricky. Um that I've just been working so slowly through them and anytime I would get an opportunity to perform, I was like, well, I better do the movements I can really play. Mm -hmm. um, but I've got to this breaking point where I'm like, I've got to do these other movements. Like I've got to do them. But on the flip side, having done the first three movements so many times, um, it really took like a year before they started to gel into the pieces that I liked them, that I, that I, yeah, they formed into the shape that felt like the piece. And before mm -hmm. that, I felt like I was Kind of experimenting and um so i feel like i am on the beginning of a new chapter with this piece presenting the, the last four movements for the first time um and i'm really excited to do the whole thing at some point um because i feel like it's it really is a journey the entire thing so yeah yeah, yeah. any final thoughts carolyn 
Thanks for sticking with it, bud. <laughs> oh my god! Notes in the second half. <laughs> Thank you for writing it. Oh my god! Thank you so much. Like the first time I read through the last movement, like I was, I was close to tears. Not not from being upset, but just like I love this. I love the way this feels. I love this subject matter. I felt like you know, there's just something very visceral about the movement and about her journey swimming and I was like yeah I'm doing it too like I'm so <laughs> but yeah it's it's really incredible so I'm just thrilled thrilled to have the opportunity yeah I'm and so you. excited to hear the last the last four I, yeah. I've, I've looked at the score Carolyn and I love how so bought you never joking earlier like you on your website you're like I make slow music for you know <laughs> and then, then this thing is not that you've you've grown <laughs> as a composer <laughs> it is it is it's hard and um and I don't yeah it's it looks it it made me very very anxious <laughs> <laughs> i'm I mean, so excited to hear them you know, um, okay. i feel like all of the notes all of the notes i mean this is this is literally where i'm at right now is you know i'm like okay i've got all these notes to play but these notes aren't notes they're water you know they're um this like this landscape that's what it is and i've i and that you know just that helps a lot to have that idea and to stop kind of let go of it being like it needs to be if I don't hit every single note it's like that's yeah that's yeah, what we're working on letting go of here not <laughs> so an it's a really cool opportunity. <laughs> I mean, well yeah. yeah it's it's really um so I try to think about yeah the texture and the feeling that I want to come across when I'm playing Lots and lots of notes underneath. <laughs> Sawing away. <laughs> Sawing away, yeah, yeah. They're the waves. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, yeah. 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 Well, um, thank you both for taking your afternoon uh, and to talk a little bit about the piece and the process. And I am so excited to hear them. Can't wait. Thank you, Leslie. Thank, thank you so you much. So much. Mm -hmm.